Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday from 1 to 1.30 p.m. I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we'll be discussing the rise of digital currency from my blog post by the same name. I would argue the relevance of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies to be massive. Although it is true that money is simply a commodity that facilitates trade between two parties, it is a rather vital commodity nevertheless. Therefore, its hijacking by government and central bankers sends a ripple of corruption that reverberates down the various levels of the economy. It is felt by all because money, currency, is the lifeblood that circulates throughout the arteries of the land. The word currency implies its necessity for incessant movement, similar to that of the current in a body of water. Always fluid, always in motion. When it stagnates by artificial dams, the result is flooding and drought. When currency is artificially impeded or diverted by currency manipulation, currency creation, quantitative easing, price controls, wage controls, rent controls, interest rate meddling, etc. The result is exacerbated poverty, homelessness, unemployment, and privation. This has been occurring in steadily increasing degrees since the Federal Reserve commandeered the currency supply in 1913. For a long time, there was very little one could do to protect oneself, aside from trading directly in cash and saving intangible assets, such as gold, silver, platinum, palladium, diamonds, precious stones, collectible artwork, etc. With the emergence of Bitcoin, all this changed. For the first time, a trading network became possible that existed entirely outside of the financial sector. This allowed consumers to trade with each other directly rather than through a third party, such as a bank, financial institution, credit card, or PayPal. This truly changed the game permanently. The people were back in control of their money to the absolute exclusion of government. Now, one may claim that, quote, Bitcoins are worthless digits with no intrinsic value, end quote. However, the market speaks differently. The power and value of Bitcoin can only come from the people willingly adopting it for use in trade. Other than for monetary transactions, Bitcoin has no other uses. Unlike gold, silver, which are useful as jewelry, hygiene, electronics, solar panels, windows, thermal conduction, heat conduction, electrical conduction, water filtration, antimicrobial, internal organ tonic, etc. Therefore, the fact that it required 10,000 bitcoins to purchase a pizza pie in 2010 and in November 2013, the value of one bitcoin equaled the price of one ounce of gold is phenomenal. Indeed, nobody could have possibly predicted such a meteoric rise this could only be possible by willing people voluntarily using it in trade and businesses voluntarily accepting it as payment. Out of the black market is born a digital beauty. So I finish with one quote by David Marcus, CEO of PayPal. I really like Bitcoin. I own Bitcoins. It's a store of value, a distributed, distributed ledger. It's a great place to put assets, especially in places like Argentina with 40% inflation, where $1 today is worth 60 cents in a year. And, uh, and a government's currency does not hold value. It's also a good investment vehicle if you have an appetite for risk, but it won't be a currency until volatility slows down. All right. So... Bitcoin, a pretty contentious topic. Uh, recently, it's been uh, more in the news, perhaps uh, the past few years. Um, 
of course, <laughs> when something does hit the mainstream news that, uh, you know, originated in such uh, cryptic uh, circumstances such as Bitcoin, uh, you can be quite sure that it won't be um, mentioned in a positive light just because of its um, inherently subversive nature. Um, so Bitcoin was started in 2009 by um, a Japanese guy, Satoshi Nakamoto. He was um, supposedly this genius who invented, who wrote the code for Bitcoin, and then he released it to the public as open source, and he disappeared. Apparently he has maybe like one million Bitcoins uh, for himself. And um, I think today that would be valued at around one billion dollars, <laughs> but um, but that doesn't really have bearing, right? On uh, you know because he was he was you know early adopters, you know that's that's the risk that you take, right? With anything that's just um, you know with a new business, you know you, you you buy stock in a new business when it's cheap, right? And you're hoping that the business will blow up, and then you can reap significant profits, right? So just like that with Bitcoin early adopters um, <clears throat> benefited greatly, right? So, for a long time, Bitcoin was maintained as a, um, you know, as a, uh, a geek um, interest, you know, as a, as a nerdy hobby, you know, trading Bitcoin between computers. That's the way, uh, that's the way it began for the, maybe the first two years, one to two years. It was basically had no value in terms of buying something in the real world um, until the first purchase, I think, was 2011. Uh, or, or, maybe, or I think it's in November 2010, maybe. And, uh, and so they bought a pizza pie with 10,000 bitcoins, right? So at that time, it was fractions of a cent. Um, and, now, and that... Uh, it's pretty famous, I think, going down in history as one of the most expensive pizza pies today since Bitcoin is, I haven't really checked, but I think it's around $500, $600 uh, US dollars per Bitcoin today. Um, and actually, it took a dip. So, so that's actually not, its, uh, not the highest that it's been. So you can imagine how, uh, <laughs> how much it's risen since then. So... So yeah, it began to become uh, gain momentum um, since tw 2011. Uh, after that, and more, some more and more businesses started accepting it. Shopify accepts it. Um, Virgin Galactic, you can go into space um, through Bitcoin. You can pay for a seat to, to <laughs> go into space. Um, I think it's something like how much is it? Hundred thousand dollars U.S. dollars? I think something like that to go, or two hundred thousand dollars maybe. I think like two hundred thousand dollars to go into space. So you can pay for that in Bitcoin. Uh, I believe certain subway franchises pay, uh, allow for Bitcoin. Um, you can go to college in certain countries with Bitcoin. You can buy um, cars in certain places with Bitcoin. Um, you can buy precious metals with Bitcoin. So it's, it's really catching on. A lot of people are realizing that, a lot of businesses are realizing that as people begin to use it more, and begin to put their money into it, it gains in value and that therefore becomes more attractive um, as a method of payment to be accepted by businesses and entrepreneurs, small businesses. So it's gaining traction. And last year um, saw a significant rise. I think uh, beginning the year 2013, it was probably around less than $200 and um, and then you have the um, you have the uh, bail-in in Cyprus, which um, occurred in April 2013. And well, and essentially, what happened with that? For those of you who don't know, um, so Cyprus is a tiny island in the Mediterranean. Uh, I think uh, very near, close to Italy, and. Um, and so there was a, um, a, a bank holiday, which means that the banks closed their doors. Um, so no 
funds in or out, right? All, all assets were frozen, all accounts were frozen. And, you know, um, expectedly this angered many people. A lot of protesting, a lot of uh, picketing and riots and everything. A pretty nasty scene. Um, you can imagine, you know, wake up, waking up uh, on Monday morning, realizing that your bank account is now frozen. And, and actually, uh, uh, leading up to that, the reason that the bank holiday occurred was I think the uh, Cypriot banks were going to default on their loans. So um, they asked the European Union, the, um, the, central, uh, what's the central bank of, of Europe, uh, the, the, yeah, the Eurozone Bank, to bail them out, right? And, they, and, and the Eurozone Bank uh, said, you have to um, freeze your banks and give us a portion of your deposit, something like that. So, so they froze the banks, um, Cypriot officials froze the banks in Cyprus, and uh, they eventually, give it, they eventually um, gave a, uh, they called it a haircut, or also a levy, or an, or an appropriation, um, but more accurately it should be called theft, because that's what it was, right? It was the uh, confiscation, seizure of the funds of the people, okay, by the banks, um, and by the Cypriot government. So, so again, this is another example of the people paying for the mistakes of extravagant spend, uh, extravagant gambling, and reckless behavior by enormous crony banks and uh, in cahoots with government um, of that region. So, so it, it, in in the end. Um, they decided to take a, I believe it was a 47% haircut or theft of, uh, of funds that were above 100,000 euros. So if you, had a, if you had a bank account above 100,000 euros, you just lost 47% of your funds, right? So um, a very uh, disconcerting thing, I'm sure, for a Cypriot citizen at the time last year. And, and actually a lot of people, as a response to that, were um, were investing heavily, heavily into Bitcoin. It, it became the uh, the asset of choice. So um, so that that's that initiated the first spike in price. Uh, I'm not sure how how high it went after that. Probably um, you know a couple hundred dollars it increased, and maybe six seven hundred dollars something like that. And um, and then in September. Uh, it was around September, October last year. Um, I believe the Silk Road was shut down, and and the uh, the Silk Road being a um, a Bitcoin exchange. It was like it was a Bitcoin exchange where people could come together and uh, trade for various services in Bitcoin. So um, and of course, you know anything you can trade, right? Including uh, uh, so-called illegal contraband stuff like uh, you know drugs and you know, cocaine, heroin, anything, you know. Um, so that site was uh, was shut down by the, um, by the United States government. And um, I believe the Charlie Shreem, I think his name, the guy who, who headed it up, he was, I believe he was arrested um, <laughs> for the crime of providing a, um, a much-needed service for people who ask for it, right? So again, no victim, no crime, right? So this is another example of a victimless crime. So as a result of that, you can now now somebody looking at that thinking, okay, you know, so the the government came in and shut down a Bitcoin exchange. That must have been a heavy blow to Bitcoin and its value, right? It must have went down after that. Well, of course not. You have to understand um, human action and uh, the fact that you cannot legislate morality. Okay, through government bans, and so what actually ended up happening was um, the government shuts down one exchange, and about <laughs> I don't know, probably ten more were created in this place, and it stimulated even more Bitcoin activity and transactions, and and the price continued to rise from seven hundred dollars, and eventually it reached a peak. I believe it was um, November, yeah, November twenty thirteen. It reached a peak of twelve hundred, I believe, twelve hundred fifty dollars, 
which at that time was roughly equivalent to one ounce of gold. So one Bitcoin last year, November, equaled one ounce of gold. Okay. So this is um, an excellent demonstration of the power of decentralized currency and how, how much currency is faith-based, in fact. You know, it only functions when people are willing to use it, when they, when they put their wealth, their time, their energy, their expertise into something and they make it, they, 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 um, make it into something that other people would want to use okay, and trade in. So this is what Bitcoin is. Um, of course, it went down after that for various reasons, um, but the rise was certainly magnificent, and I believe still is going to rise still as more and more people are are uh, coming into it because it, it is getting more popular. More businesses, you know, you, you hear more businesses all the time um, hearing uh, uh, accepting it as payment. So it's not it's not decreasing in popularity; it's actually increasing. And, and I believe certain governments have tried to ban it. Uh, I believe uh, China, um, Thailand uh, banned it. And again, every time a ban happens, it does not decrease the availability or the use of that particular uh, good or service. In fact, it increases it. So that's what happened exactly. Um, black markets rose up and uh, continued to transact in Bitcoin regardless of laws, right? Laws are, um, you know, basically, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an opinion with a gun and it's, a, it's one of the most antiquated ways of um, dealing with fellow human beings is with bringing guns into the transaction, right? These are, these are completely peaceful transactions. People, you know, want to use their Bitcoins to pay for things and people want to accept Bitcoins as payment. So where's the victim, right? There's no victim. So, so uh, government bans are, are, are quite ineffectual and um, economically damaging uh, in addition to that. So, um, but yeah, Bitcoin is a, it's a fascinating thing. The, the, the way Satoshi Nakamoto made the protocol was um, there's a total of 21 million Bitcoins that can be mined. So these are digitally mined um, through the solving of uh, mathematical algorithms um, on your computer. So it requires real work, real effort and energy to actually uh, mine these things. Uh, so it's not easy. And the way else he, he, he devised it was after each successive Bitcoin was mined, it always gets more and more difficult you know, to mine another one. So, so it keeps getting more and more and more and more difficult, right? And, um, yeah, and I, I, I forget the exact calculation, but the... Uh, you know, the last Bitcoin would take, you know, so many supercomputers, so many terabytes of, you know, it's, it just, it'd just be a massive amount of energy to, to even mine the last. So it's, uh, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, you would never run out of natural resources because you would find substitutes like, like, you know, let's say, you know, you're in a, a closed area, let's say, I don't know, in a room with a bunch of peanuts and you're opening the peanuts um, you'll never really get to the last peanut because to find the last peanut <laughs> would require such patience and dedication that uh, most people would just abandon it, right? So it would become just so monumentally difficult to mine that last Bitcoin that um, it might not even be mined. So, uh, but regardless, it, it, you know, it, it's great that it's finite and that it's scarce. This is these are among the um, the excellent characteristics of what money should be, right? So let's go over the uh, the characteristics of money. So portability, uh, you know, could be traveled, uh, could be transported. Portability, divisibility, um, fungibility, okay, um, and store of value and durability, right? So, um, so it's digital, so right. So of course it's durable. It's not going to break down over time. It's not going to rot. It's portable. You know, again, digital, it's on the internet, right? You can go anywhere in the world, you can access the internet, you can access your Bitcoin wallet, okay? Divisible, of course, you can break down one Bitcoin into fractions of a Bitcoin, all the way down to one billionth, billion with a B, of a Bitcoin. So it's quite divisible. Um, fungible, in interchangeable, so, you know, Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin, uh, although the true, the, the, um, although the specific value fluctuates based on the day, um, 
relative to each person, it's the same, right? It, there's no difference in value to each person, right? So it's the same, um, although the, the, the total value may fluctuate. Um, and then you have um, a store of value, which at the moment, since it's, it is a young currency, um, it is quite volatile, it's true. So, you know, I would not necessarily recommend people to put a significant amount of their wealth into Bitcoin. Um, but um, it is certainly, um, it certainly has the potential for great things in the future. Um, given the fact that, you know, no bank, no financial institution, no credit card can, um, you know, control it. Nothing can control it. No government can control it. There's no central, centralized hub of computers that, you know, that's where all the Bitcoins are. No, it's disseminated, it's distributed in globally, right? Um, you can have the Bitcoins, I believe, uh, on, uh, on, on a website, you can have your Bitcoin wallet, or you can have the Bitcoin wallet local onto your, onto your computer, onto your server. So, um, you know, so that's two different options. Um, so, you know, other uses for Bitcoin, one of them is, is as a will. You know, so you can uh, you can have your significant uh, portion of your wealth in, in Bitcoin, and um, and then you can write your will, and maybe you give each each person a, a different parts of the key, and then once you die, then then uh, all of them use the, you know all the keys, and they and they um, they put it together, and they you know unlock your Bitcoin wallet, and there you have the money. No lawyers, no. Uh, legal transactions, no legal fees, nothing is, uh, is necessary of that sort. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a wonderful thing. Some people have called it digital gold. Um, I like that term because it is very similar to gold minus the, um, the aspect of gold, which is, um, you know, you have to, it's physical, right? So you need somewhere to store it. You need to you need this. You need to uh, uh, protect it, you know, from theft, um, and it can get quite heavy. <laughs> Precious metals, um, Bitcoin, not necessarily. You don't have to. You don't store it anywhere really, um, since it's accessed on the internet. It's really, you know, you can access it from anywhere if you have if you have it on the internet. Uh, you just have to have your password, your key, and that's it. You're 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 in access. Of it. So. So it's wonderful to transport um, value over great distances. So um, companies like um, um, what do they call those? Those companies I forget what they call um, um, credit. No, it's um, you know the, those companies that transfer money. Let's say somebody wants to send money to the Philippines, right? Western Western Union. Yeah, Western Union. You transfer. You know, money through Western Union, and you have to pay, you know, maybe what, like 10, 15 percent, something like that, right? Uh, you know, exorbitant fees for that. Whereas Bitcoin, you know, you, you transfer money to the Philippines, you pay a few cents, not percent, a few cents, all right? So it really is amazing um, how quickly you can transfer value over long distances this way. So, you know, and, and um, you know, let's say if you want to transport your precious metals, you know, um, to another country, right? That can get kind of tricky, right? Because you have to uh, think about customs. You have to think about the TSA. You, know, you have to think about them confiscating it for whatever reason, for you, for them uh, suspecting you of being, a, you know, a terrorist or having, um, you know, why you transporting such large amounts of precious metals or cash, right? You know, you have to go through all these harassing uh, questions and uh, ridiculous questions but um, you can instead deposit them um, into Bitcoin and travel to your destination and then once you get there access your Bitcoin wallet and there you have all your cash right and convert it uh, granted the uh, the value of Bitcoin does um, change quite rapidly <laughs> so um, you know, you'd have to do that pretty quickly so that um, the value doesn't deteriorate. But I would, you know, I, I recommend people 
to you know save you know a little bit in Bitcoin you know as uh, as just a different way to invest. It's it's just I think I would put Bitcoin up there with uh, those other um, methods of uh, investing and saving, um, which would be like you know the precious metals, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, and then you have other things that people value, you know, collectible artwork or maybe diamonds, um, precious stones. Um, real estate maybe or land farmland um, so it definitely has a place it uh, has a place in one's invest investment portfolio and some people actually tell me why would I be interested in putting my money or taking it from one worthless fiat currency Federal Reserve notes and putting it into another worthless digital currency Bitcoin and this is kind of um, ignorant of the fact of the distinction between forceful interactions and voluntary interactions, right? So Federal Reserve notes are um, state-imposed currencies forcefully um, put onto us by government, and they force, we are forced to transact in these currencies um, in payments of debts, public and private, right? Also through, in order to... Uh, pay our extortion fees to the resident mafia, uh, known as the federal government, we must use Federal Reserve notes, right? Um, so it's, it's completely forced, right, and violently opposed on us, imposed on us. So we have to, you, have to, you have to distinguish that and Bitcoin, which is something that's entirely um, open source, alternative, um, peer-to-peer, decentralized, right? Completely voluntary, right? People choose to use it. You don't have to use it, of course. You know, you choose to use it. But people who choose to use it really understand the philosophy behind it, right? And the revolutionary nature that is inherent in the Bitcoin code, right? What it stands for. So just by nature of that you know people choose to use it and the added benefit is that the more people choose to use it the more the value increases right so so that's that's the first thing the second thing is you can't really say something is worthless just by saying it's digital right so uh, I mean it's the same as saying email is worthless because it's not physical <laughs> you know it's like saying Ebooks are worthless because they're not physical, right? The internet is worthless, right? Because it doesn't exist, right? In the real world, uh, which is complete um, absurdity. We all understand, right? Email most definitely has value, although it's not tangible, right? So um, we have to understand that things can have value in their digital form. And perhaps, you know, with the invention of the internet, society will now be utterly transformed, completely changed into a new paradigm, right? It has really opened the doors of communication and the transference of information over great distances. And this is a wonderful thing. Um, so we, we, we can't really make this conclusion that, you know, it's, it's digital, it's intangible, therefore it's worthless, right? So this is a fundamental ignorance of um, value, actually the subjective uh, subjective theory of value, right? We, we all, um, human beings, we, we assign value to certain things based on their usefulness and also our preferences, right? You know, um, <laughs> why would you, why would you buy a, you know, a t-shirt with, you know, a picture of John Lennon's head on the t-shirt over a t-shirt with a picture of Hitler, right? So they both were required the same amount of energy, labor, resources, um, right, cloth, <laughs> to make both t-shirts, right? But why do we as a society, most of us anyway, <laughs> values the John Lennon t-shirt over the Hitler t-shirt, right? So we have to look beyond the physical when we, when we think of value. Um, and Bitcoin certainly has value and is continually proving to have more value as each day uh, unfolds. We, we are always learning new and impressive um, 
ways of using it. So that's very optimistic and um, hopeful. Okay, for me, the way I see the future. So, folks, please use Bitcoin whenever you can. Support free markets, the black market. Support agorism. Agorism. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna end right there. This is uh, Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Um, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care.